but only one by which men can be saved came from heaven down just to die for my sin but he rose from the dead and conquered the Now sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. There's only one who has power in his name, crowned King of Kings, and he's coming back again. So until he returns, sufficient is his grace. There's only one whom I worship and pray.
the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Jesus, and every Lord, tongue confess that he is Lord.
Welcome to Mount Ara Baptist Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And thank you for tuning in to Mount TV. I'm your host, Orlana Darkens Drury. Mount TV is a resource for you to find out information that's happening here at the church, events happening in the city of Pittsburgh, and ministry opportunities. And remember, if you would like to rewatch this episode of Mount TV, visit our website. MountArad.org. But for right now, join me as we enter in the Mount Experience. Mount Arad Church family and guests, we are so excited and honored you are here with us. Our 2023 theme is doing it better. And our foundational scripture is found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Let's get ready to do ministry better. If you are worshiping with us in person or plan to worship with us soon, we invite you to adhere to our sanctuary etiquette guidelines. Wearing a mask is optional. Refrain from eating or drinking inside the sanctuary. Do not walk during the worship time of giving or during the sermon. And respectfully follow the instruction and direction of the ushers at all times. The ushers are charged with understanding and enforcing sanctuary etiquette and maintaining a worshipful experience. Parents and guardians, Mount Arad's Booth Sunday School for Youth offers a hybrid experience where youth and teens come together in person or online. For more information, visit our website, mountarad.org. That's mt-arad.org. Click the Youth of the Mount page and register your child today. We are excited to inform you about an opportunity to join Mount Arad's youth and young adult praise teams. Listen in to this one-on-one -on -one conversation between Orlana Dark and Drury and Trini Massey. Trini Massey, Minister of Worship at Mount Air Baptist Church. Welcome to Mount TV. Hey, Orlana, how are you, doll? You doing good? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad you're here because there's exciting things happening in our music department where we are expanding so share with us what we can expect yeah so you know i grew up in church right so i started singing with the sunshine band the youth choir yada yada i got my musical uh wings from church and so um we're in a time now where we're trying to open it up now for our young people one for me to mentor help train push and grow the next generation of singers choir directors worship leaders whatever it is and so um on january 31st i'm holding open call auditions for ages 13 to 17 um, and then 18 to 40 uh, to get some, you know, get these young people active and say, come on, let's go, let's sing together. We just had some auditions yesterday, met some amazing young people that are about to be a part. So, I mean, let's, we're trying to grab some more, as many as possible. And the good thing is, um, you know, it's open to everybody. You don't have to be, they don't have to be a member of Mount Ararat. You know, you can just come, you know, young people need a place. To, uh, to do, you know, especially young people that have interest in music and that part of the creative arts, a place to do it. Awesome. So if I'm interested, which I'm outside your, your age range, but if I'm you interested know. in auditioning, uh -huh. how, how should I arrive? What should I be prepared to do? What are you expecting? On the 31st, it starts at 6.30. So I want you to do, I want you to come. When you get there, you fill out a little form, put your information down, name, and all that. And then just have a song, your favorite song. I don't care if it can be gospel, be praise and worship. It could be R&B and hip hop. Whatever your favorite song is that you feel comfortable singing, just bring your song, bring your voice, and let me hear it. You know, we'll be there to listen and uh, see where you are vocally, see if we can place you on the team and go from there. All right. And so after that, um, how will individuals be notified if they made it or not? Uh, you will be not. You'll be contacted that week, probably within uh, probably within two or three days like after the audition to let you know via uh, email or phone call. One of the team members, my, either myself or one of my team members will reach out to the young people and young adults let them know you are in you know i don't see me turning anybody away just want y'all to come we'll make i can we find i can make my sing if you cheat if you if you allow me all right cool <laughs> <laughs> all right so trini massey minister of worship mount air baptist church thank you so much for joining us today oh thank you for having me it's my pleasure thank you so much young people i can't wait to see you all right 
Plan to attend Tuesday, January 31st at 6.30 p.m. at the church, located at 271 Paulson Avenue in East Liberty, inside the Mang Sanctuary. If you have any questions, send an email to information at mountarat.org. That's information at mt-arat.org today. Here's what's happening in Pittsburgh. You're invited. Join us for Urban League Sunday on February 12th from 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. at Mount Arab Baptist Church located at 271 Paulson Avenue in East Liberty featuring guest preacher Reverend Glenn Grayson, senior pastor at Wesley Center AME Zion Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and music provided by Trini L. Massey and Mount Arad's praise team and band. Spread the word. All are welcome. Plan to attend. As we prepare to worship God, remember at Mount Ararat, you can give the following ways. Traditionally by way of cash or check, electronically on our website, mountarat.org, on our mobile app by using PayPal or ACS. If you have a smartphone, you can give by using Cash App at dollar sign Mount Arat, Givelify, or text to give. For debit card users, call the front office Monday through Friday between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. at 412-441-1800. To review our giving options, visit our website, mountarat.org today. Praise the Lord, Mount Eric. Can we stand to our feet and sing together? It's time for worship. Anybody come with a praise on your heart? Hallelujah. We're going to give him the glory. Great things he has done. Let's sing the hymn together. Song says, to God be the glory. Let's sing. To God be the glory. Great things he has done.
Anybody. Hallelujah. He's been my provider, my sustainer. He's been my sufficient protector. And God, we honor you. We want to collectively take the time to worship him with the concentration of our minds. And this song just asks God to fill us up until we overflow. We want to run over. Anybody want to run over? I need more of his power. I need more of his presence. Let's sing the song together. It says, you provide the fire, sing. You provide the fire. Come on, sing, I'll provide the sacrifice. I'll provide the sacrifice. The song says, if you pour out your spirit. you pour out your spirit. That's it. Come on, sing it. I will open up inside. I will open up inside. Come on, sing it again from the bottom of your heart. If you provide, if you provide the fire, I'll provide the sacrifice. If you pour out the spirit, yeah, I will love. say, fill me up. Say, fill me up. That's it. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. Fill me up. Yes, Lord, we're asking you. Because we need you. Fill Come on. You provide the fire. I'll provide the sacrifice. Come on, worship the Lord. If you provide your spirit, you provide your spirit. Yeah, I will open up inside. Hallelujah. 
Come on, sing it one more time. You provide the fire. inside. Come on, y'all, sing it out. Fill me up. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. Come on, sing it again. together you you provide the fire I'll provide the sacrifice you sing it. Fill me up, God. Fill me. Come on, you gotta mean it when you sing it. Fill me up. Yes, Lord. With your power. With your anointing. Come on, sing it again. Say, fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up, Lord. With your glory. Come on. today is found in the Bible book of Psalms, chapter 18, verses 16 through 19. Let us read together. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Let us pray. What a mighty God we serve. Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne of, of grace and mercy. 
We are so grateful that we can even approach you. We have brothers and sisters throughout the world who are undergoing persecution, who cannot be seen holding a written word. So we ask you to shine down on them, smile down on them, help them keep the faith as they continue to go through the persecution. We thank you for the heavenly host that gives you praise and glory. We ask that the heavens proclaim your majesty and the earth proclaims your glory. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave your son Jesus to us to be a ransom sacrifice for us, to straighten out the, the scales of injustice. And so Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for giving us the opportunity for everlasting life. We ask you to pray for those who are sick those who are undergoing mourning for loss of loved ones. Take care of our pastor, our shepherd. Fill him up as he pours out to us. We thank you for all the kingdom people who are here today. Bless each household. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And with this, we all say, amen. Till all they see, fill my life till all they is you, Lord. Is you, Lord, glorify. Come on, sing the song, fill my life, everybody. Well, come on, help me thank God for any and all first-time visitors who share with us in physical space. And help me thank God for everybody that's worshiping with us online all across the world. This is a day that the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. You may be seated even in the presence of the Lord as our ushers make preparation for us to lift our morning offering to Render unto God our tithes and offerings. Those who are worshiping with us online, there are on each of our platforms opportunities, if this is your first time, to sign up in no more than three steps so that you can join us in our attempt to be faithful in our stewardship. Errat, I rely on Deacon Ann Germany, who has given her life to health in Allegheny County. She stays very actively and aggressively connected to the Allegheny Health Network and they are always uh, on a weekly basis providing me reports of where we are in COVID. She excitedly texted me this past week and said, COVID numbers in Allegheny County are way, way down, and we thank God for that, right? We appreciate, we appreciate that. 
She also uh, finished her text by saying that she is very confident that we can, for the not foreseeable future, return to mask optional so that if you don't want to wear your mask, you don't have to. And we will continue to be vigilant because we know we are our brothers and sisters keepers. I've been flying back and forth preaching. And um, I can tell you, somebody asked me the other day, do I suffer from trauma in any area of my life? I said, yes. They said, how? I said, I get on planes, and if a person coughs or sneezes, I'm ready to throw them off the plane. Like, hey, bro, no coughing on this plane, no sneezing, right? Because of all that COVID has done and the lives that have been taken from us. So we will remain very vigilant with regard to this. And I remind us all the time, because we are people of faith, we know what it means to be in our homeland and among our kinfolk and among our family and for God to approach us and say, leave your family, leave your kinfolk, leave the place of familiarity and go to a place I will show you. And what does the next verse say? And the next morning, Abraham gathered and went his way to the Ur of the Chaldees, right? So we remain a very flexible people, a very adaptable people, which means this may change at any moment. And I'm appreciative to those of you who know how to flow with us as the change necessitates. So we can thank God for progress and we remain ever vigilant and we're grateful. We're grateful that God remains an ever present hedge of protection around us. Are we ready to give? All right, let's lift those electronic devices, our envelopes, let us pray. God, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you because every good and perfect gift comes from you. Receive our tithes and offerings as expressions of our worship. They come from spirits full of extreme gratitude and thanksgiving. We are thankful for who you are and we're thankful for what you do and we thank you for the ways you make. We thank you for the protection that you provide. Thank you for the seed that you've given to us to sow. And we thank you for the harvest from which we've been blessed to collect. We give to you the first fruits because you have asked for it. We don't do it grudgingly. We don't do it of necessity. We do it cheerfully because we can't ever beat you giving. You've given the best, that is your son the shedding of his blood for our redemption and our atonement, our salvation and our justification. So what can we render unto you in comparison for the great sacrifice you've given us in Christ? And yet we present this first fruits offering to you and we ask that you would multiply it and use it for the upbuilding and the advancement of your kingdom here on earth. God, thank you for giving us this safe space in the midst of this toxic and vitriolic culture. And thank you that while we're in this safe space, we can feel your peace that surpasses all human understanding. Arrest our wandering minds and bring in all of our straying emotions and harness them under the power of the Holy Spirit so that when we leave this place, we are fully equipped that we are able above what eyes can see and ears can hear to handle our time, responsibility, and stewardship in the marketplace. We thank you, God, for making us your people, and we thank you for being our guide. We thank you for breathing into us the breath of life, and thank you for being a hedge of protection around our lives. Many of us have no idea how close we came this week to peril, and yet you kept the enemy at bay. Thank you that you're continuing to do your perfect work in us. You have begun it and you are perfecting it. And so while all of us cannot literally lay ourselves upon the altar, we ask that you receive this sanctuary as a total altar and we lay ourselves upon it, presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. Would you mold us and shape us and fill us and fix us and anoint us and transform us for your glory? And we know that whenever we are chasing your glory, you are also at the same time working for our good. 
and for it all we give you thanks. We ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's children said together, amen. As our ushers are coming and right before our praise team sings to prepare us for preaching, I uh, woke up yesterday morning and I felt as clear a burden as I'm talking to you today for a couple of weeks of daily prayer. And so I want to ask you to join me every day at 12 noon, however much time you can dedicate to it. It's not going to require you to pray for 30 minutes, 15 minutes. It could be a minute prayer, two minutes. If you're on your job and you're going to get in trouble, sneak into the bathroom and uh, spend a minute in prayer. And each week I'm going to give us a topic. I am of the firm opinion as the author of the book I introduced you to some years ago entitled The Prayer Circle. I am of the firm opinion that when people circle issues in prayer and storm heaven on behalf of an issue, that God not only changes things, but God changes who? God, are y'all talking to me today? God changes people, right? And God changes circumstances and environments. We are living in a toxic culture. And if you're like me, you almost don't even want to turn the news on. You don't want to read anything because you know it's going to come with some kind of adversarial tone in the conversation. People are excessively combative in this culture. You, um, you have any engagement with anybody and it's almost like they immediately draw lines and pull weapons as if you're about to go to war, right? And so one of the ways that we mitigate against that is to not just be people who critique the culture, but because we are the people of God and the Bible says we are the salt of the earth. We are a city set on a hill. We are a light that cannot be hid. That means if God's people call upon God's name, humble themselves and, and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, he promises that he will hear our prayers from heaven. He will forgive us of our sins. And here's why I'm doing it. He will heal our land, right? I believe in prayer. I believe in prayer. And I want us to focus our prayers each week. This week, I'm going to ask you, Monday through Saturday, I want you to focus your prayer on asking God to detoxify you from the toxicity of the culture. To detoxify you that you don't become inside what the culture is becoming outside. That's the prayer. Lord, purge me of the rage and the anger and the combat mentality, the adversarial perception of things. If somebody says something to me, help me not to go straight to 10. Yeah, you know, I'll go incrementally. Help me just go to nine this time. No, I'm just playing. I'll just play. <laughs> I'm just playing. Yeah, not straight to 10, no, you know. So, you know, so, yeah, down there. I'm, I'm honest with my prayers, Lord. I ain't ready to go to one, but help me just not to go to 10. Detoxify me from the toxicity of the culture. Don't let me become so um, affected by the trauma of the culture. Don't let me walk around choosing sides. I was um, in conversation with two Christians about... Um, a task that needed to be performed and they're good friends but the way they were attacking each other about how to accomplish it forced me to have to address it hey bros we brothers we don't need anybody to bleed when this conversation is over we just need a result from this conversation you feel what I'm saying to you 
So we want God to detoxify us from the toxicity of the culture. Every day, 12 o'clock, wherever you are, just take a moment. Some of you may want to join in a circle with other people and do that. Feel free to do that if you don't want to pray by yourself. But at 12 o'clock, we're going to pray. And for several weeks, each Sunday, I'll give you a topic that we'll pray about for the upcoming week. Is that okay? How many of you are going to join me in a season, a season of prayer? All right. Come on, praise team. Prepare us for preaching.
Well, God is great, and he is greatly to be praised. Once again, I want to call your attention to 2 Peter chapter 3, and I want to read in your hearing verses 17 and 18. And the word of the Lord reads like this, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And I want to talk this weekend as the Spirit of the Lord shall guide from the subject, Better Choices. Everybody say, I want to make better choices. Peter is fighting hard to not let believers in Christ get swept up in the critiquing attacks coming from who he describes as false teachers. These false teachers are questioning everything they know Christians believe, pressing hard on the fears of the people. They persistently raise doubts in the minds of believers raising suspicions about the delay of Jesus's return. And this strongly contributes to what Peter fears is becoming a fragile spirituality for the people and he knows that he needs to address it. And so he reminds them that the thinking of those attacking the faith, these false teachers as he describes them, he wants saints to know their teaching is so earthbound so time imprisoned, so without respect to the might and majesty and the eternality of God, that they are attempting to box God in as if God is not bigger than our thinking and that God is not more supreme than our rational considerations. And just as a snippet of what Peter says in rebuttal to the false teachers doubting the day of judgment or the return of the Lord, Peter leans on Psalm 90, verse 4, where the psalmist expresses the eternal stretch of God when the psalmist says, don't forget that a thousand years for us can be like yesterday for God. His point is clear, isn't it? The attack of the rational mind when it comes to issues of faith has to always be sifted through a surrendered humility. That when you think you know everything about God, you're really revealing that you don't know that much about God at all. Paul says, stay humble because you are seeing through a glass darkly. That whatever perception you have of God in this room right now is not enough to ever encompass who God is. That whatever your opinion of God's ways, God's thoughts, God's expectations, God's expressions, however you think about it, it's too limited to encompass all that God is and all that God thinks. Don't forget what scripture teaches. His ways are what? Okay, 10 of y'all know the Bible. Let's catch you up. Lord, help me. His ways are above our ways, and his thoughts are above our thoughts. This is what Peter is getting at, and his strong encouragement is to accept that you are living in the mystery of it all, knowing that what's not a mystery is that God is real, that God is eternal that God has redeemed humanity. God has justified us by our faith. So Peter says, given what you do know, all the things that I've just mentioned, do your best to live a saved life. In fact, view it all through the lens of salvation. That's verse 15. Interpret, he says, the master's patient restraint for what is really salvation. And he means this, instead of doubting whether or not Christ is real because he has delayed his return, instead be thankful that God is patiently restraining himself from returning because he's given us a chance to work out our own soul's salvation. 
This is what he's teaching. Peter says it's what he believes. And he also suggests that while it may not have been as clearly stated or as easily understood, it's what Paul was referring to in his own writings. And for Peter, it is clear that he expects those who believe in Christ to not then be so easily swayed by people who go around twisting this kind of theological truth. Because those trying to destroy straight teaching about God, Peter says, are at the same time destroying themselves. And here is where in the progression of Peter's thoughts that I wanted us to sermonically pause and ponder the instructions that he hands out because he's teaching that resisting these truth twisters, combating the doubt and suspicions that they raise, the seeds of wonder and speculation that they plant, your response, your reaction, your decisions, your considerations will not be gifted to you as God gives a miracle. They're not going to come on the end of unfolding revelation. It's going to come only because you decide in your life that for me to honor God, I'm not going to chase easy choices. That being a Christian is not a guarantee that God is going to make all my choices easy. I don't expect that with blessing comes ease of all decision making. Are y'all listening to me? I will not avoid hard choices, but not only will I not avoid hard choices, I will not be led by others' choices. I'm going to steward the privilege God has given me to make a choice, and as I grow in faith, I'm going to offer to him better choices. This is what Peter says. Friends, be well warned, be on guard, lest you lose your footing and get swept off your feet by these lawless and loose-talking teachers. Instead, grow in grace and in the understanding of our Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know that sounds closely and eerily similar to the rustic King James, so let me open it up a little more in the Amplified Version because I think it illuminates it a little better. He says, therefore, let me warn you, beloved, knowing these things beforehand, be on your guard so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men who distort doctrine. And then you're going to fall from your own steadfastness of mind, knowledge, truth, and faith. But grow spiritually mature in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory and honor and majesty and splendor both now and to the day of eternity. And then Peter says, let me put some weight on it. So he closes it by saying, amen. Do you all hear it? You can walk a more powerful spiritual life. You can honor God in the multiplicitous areas of your life. You can resist the influential pull of the culture and not feel pressed by the intimidating volume and certainty with which false teachers promote their false ideas and beliefs, their desires and opinions, and it requires this spiritual discipline. I love God so much for giving me choices that I want to honor him by giving him better choices. Thank God for our freedom to choose. It's a gift given to us by God. But how many of us know in this room that while you are grateful that God has given you the freedom of choice, you also can confess you could be giving God a lot better choices. Let me say it again. Is this working? Is, is it working? Uh, is it working? Okay, let me say it again. How many of you know that while God has blessed you with the freedom of choice, you have not always been a good steward of that freedom. And if you're honest, you and I know we could offer God a lot better choices with regard to our lives. 
choices about what matters most in life and how do I make what matters most in life matter most to me choices about my reception of my response to my reaction to the things that are said to me and done to and around me choices about how much influence I'm going to give to voices attached to my life and what filter or strainer am I going to use to sift whether they are speaking truth from falsity choices about my heart and who I'll open my heart to and if I open it for how long and when do I have to protect my heart and shut the door and let somebody live on proximity but not in sacred space choices about how I want my life to be known and remembered and embraced and respected and treated with care and appreciated choices about how I spend my time and who I spend my time with and why am I spending time with them choices about how to become the me that God intended and if I'm not the me that God intended how do I make the choice to crucify myself so that I can live by my faith in him everybody say choices And this text is teaching us a couple of things. This text is teaching us what is so powerful with regard to choices. And it is this. Your faith progress, Peter implies. Your faith progress is worth protecting. Did you catch what I'm... Okay, that's all right. Let me, let me say it a couple other ways. What you and God have fought to do to get you where you are should not be so cheaply negotiated by the opinion of other people. What you know God has been able to do to pull you from where he redeemed you and set you where he has positioned you. Only you know how much God has had to intervene in the cracks and crevices of your life's progression to get you to a place of peace to help you to love yourself again to make you not ashamed of who you have become and when you have gone through what you've gone through to get where you are having paid the price you paid having surrendered what you've surrendered watching God do what God has done you don't sell that cheaply you protect that and if you have to you put up a fight in order to protect your choice Now, to attach this textually, and I don't normally do this, so forgive me for it, but I need to read a large block of chapter 2 to make this point. When you leave here, if you don't like my sermon, at least you can say he gave us the word. <laughs> Verse 16, he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories or myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty that was their way of saying we ain't telling you what we heard this ain't theory this is not speculation this is not rumor this is not conjecture we was there we saw fish and loaves multiplied. We watched blind people receive sight. We saw a man get up from a mat. We saw him in the middle of a raging storm stand and say, peace be still. And the storm had to subside. We saw him lay hands on the sick and they recovered. We watched him as he spoke the word and people's lives were transformed. We're not giving you theory. We were there. His grandeur, his authority, his sovereignty, we were eyewitnesses. For when he was invested with honor and the radiance of the Shekinah glory from God the Father, such a voice as this came to him from the splendid, majestic glory in the bright cloud that overshadowed him saying, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased and delighted. And we actually heard the voice. 
made from heaven when we were together with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more certain. You do well to pay close attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and light breaks through the gloom and the morning star arises in your hearts. But understand verse 20, this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of or comes from one's own personal or special interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Did you hear Mount Ararat? Did you hear the depth of the teaching that has matured in Peter? And Peter says has matured in those he is referencing in his teaching. All of them intent on producing a harvest of ministry, might, and mission. And Peter is issuing the reason for you and I to fight to make better choices for God fight because the progress has been so transforming that you need to in the choices you make in life you need to protect your progress you are connected to God's revealed mind God's expressed thoughts God's eternal will God's extended blessing God's eternal favor God's powerful anointing God's awesome provision and the fact that you're connected to it made progress on it elevate it because of it you are not who you used to be so don't let anybody make you sacrifice your progress turn and tell somebody I ain't going back turn and tell them I've come too far Come on, talk to him. Tell him, I ain't going back. I've come too far. I've seen too much. I've survived too much. I've recovered from too much. I'm enjoying too much. I'm stewarding too much. I'm living in the eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. And why would I want to give that up? The devil is a liar. It's, it's the word. I'm sorry, y'all. You know, so sometimes, sometimes those of you who come to 1030, you have to suffer from the excitement I have from Saturday night at 830 because I know where I'm going. Peter said, it's the word I proclaim to us with so much in life, Mount Ararat going backwards while time is moving forward. There has been spiritual progress in your life that no amount of struggle should make you sacrifice. There's been spiritual progress in your life that no enemy attack, no disappointing experiences should make you give up that progress. You don't come back from the things some of us have come back from and then negotiate your progress away. I don't, listen, I don't care how many people around you want to suggest to you when you tell them God has brought me this far and they say, how do you know it was God? Maybe it was your human ingenuity. Maybe it was your intellectual acumen. Maybe it was the people around you. Maybe it was your education. Maybe it was just time and the force of nature. Maybe it's the cyclical nature of life. Maybe it's what happens that in the cyclical nature of life, you have seasons where you have to suffer and you have seasons where you seem to experience surplus. Let them say everything they want to say. Don't fight them. Don't get no argument about it. And when they finish, tell them, say whatever you want to say, believe whatever you want to believe. But let me tell you how I got where I've got. Jesus. No, it's because of technology and the advancement of artificial intelligence and we have access to more information these days. Thank God for the computer and look at all that you can access. Thank God for Google. You know they're trying to get Google in the brain. So it's not all God. It can't be God because you know they have had scientific proof. Some scientists that are trying to say that the earth came from the big boom theory and that you and I evolved from something else and all of these kind of theories that come around. And artifacts can be shown. They can go and try to find a place where Jesus was buried and they can try to dissuade us from believing that Jesus rose from the dead or perhaps his body was stolen and held somewhere in secret so as to imply that he was resurrected. Let them talk. 
Let them say everything they're going to say. And then when they ask for your rebuttal or for your response, tell them, say what you want to say. But I know how I got where I am because I know when I hear God's voice, I can tell when God is leading me. I know what God feels like when he's stirring inside of me. I know when God has opened a door for me. I know when God has made a way for me. I know when God has backed the enemy up off of me. I know that what I've received has come straight from God above. I can tell that I was not capable. I was not qualified. I could not have handled the things that God has given to me and only because he is God could this have taken place I was telling 830 y'all think about it with the intricate complexity of the human physical frame you can't tell me that there ain't no God No, I'm serious. You can't tell me there is no God because not one of us in here, no matter how much access to education we have, you could have been a fellow in the best institution on the planet and you could have studied neurosurgery for all of your life. But how do you take a nerve from a calf and put it up in the neck? And while you can't connect it to make it fire up to bring passage, when it gets in there because of how sovereign our God is. He wired your body to be coded to recognize its own DNA and when they take a piece of nerve from one part of your body and plant it in another part, those two separated pieces will eventually find each other and the twain will become one flesh. <laughs> oh my God, I wish I had somebody in here. How do you explain? That when a virus enters your body, your body goes on straight attack. And I know why we try to take stuff to knock a fever out. I'm not trying to knock that. But please understand that God is so wise in his omniscience that he knew that things would invade the body. And what does God do? He made sure that while you sleep at night, your body temperature rises to push out something that got in there that was designed to kill you. Do you think that every time you sit down and eat that you're eating food that has not been contaminated, over processed and over sprayed and yet when you wake up you're still seated and clothed and in your right mind you better pray over your food here's what I say Lord sanctify this food for the nourishment of my body because I don't know what they did to it back in the kitchen. I don't know what happened to it while it was on the truck and God knows I don't know what was sprayed on it out in the field. I don't know how much they injected into it. So when it gets into me, God, I need you to stick your hand in my life and make sure that what was meant for my demise is transformed for my development. Do I have any company in this room? Somebody talk your head back, mask on or not, and tell them, thank you. Only you know. That's the point I'm trying to make. Only you know the ground you have covered. The journey you've been on with Jesus that brings you to this current space. I wish I could pass the mic because every one of us could say, if I hadn't met him, <laughs> here's about how my life was probably going to look and you can't let anything make you consider negotiating away that kind of spiritual progress you, you know when you've heard God's voice you know when you felt God's presence you, you have to fight to protect that why? because the intent of the enemy is to confuse your choices come on I know I'm I'm getting long. Um, no, it's just because stuff comes while I'm preaching. And so, so Adam and Eve are created, and Eve is wandering in the garden, and the serpent encounters her. And the serpent knows that the serpent cannot destroy Eve. So what does he attempt to do? Corrupt her choices. <laughs> Can't kill her. Because life and death belongs to God. The serpent can't kill her but he can corrupt her choices. And how does he corrupt her choices? By making her doubt the truth of what has been proclaimed to her. And then she goes back, and what does she do? She plants the doubt in Adam until he questions his choice to not eat of the forbidden. And the moment they eat, 
they understand death. Are y'all listening to me? So the intent of the enemy is to confuse your what? Which means where is the enemy more than likely going to launch his attack? In the mind. Because you've been transformed by the renewing of your mind. So now that your mind has been renewed, here's the enemy's attack launch. You have a renewed mind, but you still are fighting an old nature. So, so what does the enemy want you to do? The enemy wants you to be caught in the throes of a choice. Do I choose to surrender to the transformed me or do I revert to a choice and shake hands with my old nature? Which is why Paul says, how shall we, I did, this ain't even in here, I'm just going where I'm going. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Well, the answer is because you made a choice. And just as you made a choice to go back, Peter says, make the choice to fight for the truth that you already know. Child, where is God now that your mama's gone? Where is God now that you fired from the job? Where is God with all this happening with COVID? Where is God with the incredulity and the toxicity of the Republicans in Congress? God is the same place he is all the time. He's on the end of my choice to turn my burdens over to him. And he'll be right there. Remember what William James said, and I'll move on. He said, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. The greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. I'm simply preaching this because I want you to make the choice to fight to protect your belief in and about Christ. Not only is this text teaching us about our growth being worth protecting, and therefore, it calls for better choices. But this text is also teaching that we make better choices because spiritual transformation was God's gift to you. The stewardship of your choices is your offering to him. So Peter says, steward your choices by intentional spiritual practice. Here's specifically how he puts it. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Choices are better when you're making them in the filtering milieu of continual spiritual practice. Which means choices are always better when I leave them to the exercise of prayer. Let me talk to this side. Choices are always better when I leave them to the discipline of meditation. When I decide that I'm going to submit to solitude and surrender only to the voice of God, choices come out better. You make better choices not because you decide to pray only when big choices need to be made. You make better choices because you exercise the discipline of making better choices even when they're smaller choices. Are you listening to me? So that you treat your spirituality as a matter of life and death because you make better choices because you guard what influences them. Write this down if you are a person who takes notes because the choices you make, make you. This is why Nelson Mandela, after all he experienced in the struggle for freedom for his people in South Africa, said, your choices have to reflect your hopes and not your fears. And Erat, I'm suggesting that Jesus feeds your hopes and arrests your fears when he reveals his promises and reminds you of your value, strengthens you by his spirit. So because of what he does, your offering to him is to guard your choices and not just make choices. Final thing, make better choices because your progress is worth protecting. Make better choices because transforming your choices was God's gift to you. Stewarding your choices is your offering to him. Finally, make better choices in life because better choices make better choices available. Ooh, 
anointing. If you like what making godly choices have created in your life, then please know that if you keep making better choices, the Lord will keep making his presence influential, sovereign in your choices. Do I need to say that again? If you keep making better choices because of God, God will keep infusing his will in your choices. Now, Peter says it this way, grow spiritually mature in the grace and knowledge and truth and faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then listen to this promise, to him be glory and honor, majesty, splendor, and here it is, both now and to the day of eternity. You're missing your opportunity to shout. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can help you. How many of us have at times needed God in an emergency choice situation and because it was an emergency, we bled out our prayer, we fasted and prayed, we sought other spiritual people to join us in consecrated prayer, we had perfect attendance in church, and then once the crisis subsided, we found ourselves backing up off of what helped us to make a better choice. Well, here's what Peter says, don't back up, child of God, because God is not just sovereign over your choices now. He is sovereign over your choices through time unto eternity. I wish I had somebody here. Every choice you make in Jesus gives you the blessing of making in Jesus the next choice, which means we're all in this room essentially nothing more than the choices we make as we stand in this infinite sphere of endless choices. And you ask the question then, Pastor, how do I choose right? And I'm going to tell you how. You know how you choose right every time. Don't choose right because one seems the better option economically. Don't choose right because you think it makes a better option relationally. When I'm stuck trying to make a choice, when a loved one says, it's your choice whether they resuscitate me or not, I've had to go to the hospital and stand with families as they wrestle with the choice. Do we tell them to pull the plug or do we keep it in and see what happens to mama or daddy past? Do I divorce or do I stay married? Do I switch jobs? How do I handle the doctor giving me the decision as to whether or not I get seed implant or get the whole prostate removed. What do I do when they tell me that they could only take one breast, but it might be better for me if they take both? How do I handle my kids and the decisions that are going to have to drastically be made in order to turn them in the direction of a positive and powerful trajectory? Pastor, tell me, what do I choose? And some people think I'm being flippant when I say to them, Adolf, that that choice is too complex for you to choose one side or the other. So you're going to have to do like Ezekiel does when God says to him, hey, son of man, I need you to make a choice. Can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, that's out of my pay scale. I can't answer that. If I say they can't live, I'm doubting the reality of God. If I say they can live, I got people behind me who are prognosticating that God ain't real. But what I can do when I'm stuck in a choice, I can choose God and when I choose God he then makes the choice for me this is what I do whenever I'm stuck in a choice and I've had to make them over the 25 years of leading this congregation and when I'm stuck do we buy or do we sell do we start or do we sever do we promote or do we not promote and then I have to turn it over to the Lord and say Lord I can't choose A or B I'm choosing you and because I choose you you lead me and you guide me along the way. Do I have any company in this building? I'm done, I'm done. C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis is right when he says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying that really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. You hear that, Shane? 
He says, that's one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. C.S. Lewis says, you must make a choice. Either this man, Jesus, was and is the son of God, or he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord. <laughs> But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. And that's it. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And Aaron, I only give you the quote because I want to tell you I'm with C.S. Lewis. I choose to believe that Jesus is the son of God. I ain't ever seen the empty grave. Are y'all listening to me in here? I've never stood under the cross where Jesus was crucified. I was not privileged to be in the upper room where he made his post-resurrection appearance. And I wasn't there when the women were taking the spices to the tomb and then had to encounter the angel. I didn't show up when Thomas was given the privilege to stick his finger in Jesus' hands where the nails had been pressed or to stick his fist in in Jesus' side where the spear had been thrust. I didn't see any of it. I have no empirical evidence that Jesus got up from the grave. But you know why I preach it? Because I've been, I've been so stuck in sin that when Jesus pulled me out of sin and gave me salvation, I made the choice that I believe in him. I don't know how much stuff in life is real, but I know he is real. Turn and tell somebody, I choose to believe in him. I know that he is real. How do I know he's real? Because I can feel him. I said, I can feel him in my heart. I hear him speaking in my thoughts. I watch him create and orchestrate in life. I witness him wrap his love around unlovable people. I know he's real because I've watched him change the taste of a drug addict and make that drug addict drop his or her drugs and pick up the blood of Jesus. Have I got a witness here? I've watched him take a person who was mean and ornery and turn them around until they're seated clothed and in their right mind. I'm telling you I've watched him take a gangbanger who came in here curious chasing one of our women and then months later watch him stand and sing the opening hymn. Clap while the praise team is singing and respond to the sermon. I've watched him walk up in Allegheny General Hospital and when I laid my hands on the sick I've watched him heal somebody's body until they said pastor I was feeling sick until you prayed for me but now that you prayed I'm feeling a whole lot better I've watched him encourage somebody seated on the second row while the casket was in front of them leaned over crying screaming like life was never going to have any joy again. And then months later, I've watched God stir up joy until the Christian had to exclaim, this joy I had. The world did not give it, and the world can't take it away. I've watched him open doors that Christians didn't even have a key to. I've watched him back up the devil when the devil was on frontal attack who am I talking to in this building why don't you grab somebody bring them close and tell them I choose to believe and if I choose to believe, nobody has to sing me excited and nobody has to preach me motivated. Nobody has to dance me into a good mood. I'm making a choice that Jesus is worth a hand clap. 
that Jesus is worth a song that Jesus is worth a shout that Jesus is worth a praise that Jesus is worth the worship that Jesus is worth the adoration do I have any company here turn and tell somebody I wasn't there when he got up from the grave but I can still testify that early Sunday morning he got up uh, with all power in his hand say yeah Come on, if you're going to make a choice, make a choice. Somebody make the choice that he's worth you opening your mouth and making a joyful noise. Say yeah. You don't just make choices, you are your choices. You become your choices. And nobody can make you make a choice unless you decide you're going to abnegate your choices to somebody else's opinions and expectations. Who am I talking to in this room today? I can trace steps in my life where one choice seemingly small would have changed the entire trajectory of my journey. Now, it may not have had anything to do with level of success or failure, but it would have been different. That's the point. It would have been drastically different. I can think about relationships I've had over the years and how that relationship introduced me to people who have become my best friends. I was asked to drive Charles Booth when he was the revivalist at New Psalmist when I was 17 years old and I was embarrassed. I almost turned it down because I had a little small Honda Civic. Dr. Booth was six foot one, six foot two. And I was embarrassed to go pick up a distinguished clergyman in a Honda Civic. And he got in that car and started complimenting how the car was riding. I know he was making it up. But he, no, seriously, he was just encouraging the young preacher. What a, what a car. How much mileage you get on this and gas. Wow, look at how this rides. And I knew what he drove in Columbus, Ohio. I was like, yeah, be nice. <laughs> you just being nice, right? And Charles Booth called and said, listen, you're going to be in New Jersey. And you're going to be preaching at a church that's around the corner from a young preacher I want you to meet. So when you get there, I want you to call him, and I'm going to call him and tell him he needs to come hear you preach. And it was that instruction and the choice to make the phone call that introduced me to Jerry Carter, who became my best friend. It was saying yes to an invitation to do a men's breakfast and service afterwards in Baltimore. And the choice to get there early 
which meant I had to get up super early to drive from York, Pennsylvania to Baltimore to introduce me to John Guns. I was having a revival and Carl Solomon, who grew up with me in New Psalmist, we were on staff together. He drove Claude Alexander up to York and when church was over, I was ready to run out the door and one of the members had caught me and I was ministering to her and when I finished and turned around, Carl and Claude were standing there and it was that moment I was introduced to Claude Alexander. I had been offered churches when I pastored in York, Pennsylvania and I just didn't feel like the call was there. And then in 1996, when George Johnson called down to Shiloh and asked if I could just come preach at this vacant church called Mount Ararat. And I was thinking to myself, man, I can't go to Pittsburgh. I'm in the middle of my doctoral degree. If I change my location, I'm going to start all my writing over again. And God said, if they call you, you better pick your writing happy behind up and get on up that highway. And I said, yes, sir. All right. And it was the choice to respond to that that spent my world 26 years later in this pulpit telling you, listen, listen, telling you don't take not one choice for granted. Am I talking to anybody in here? Don't take not one choice for granted because every choice you make is going to somehow make you. Hands are lifted, heads are elevated. I want you to take a moment in your own prayer ground and whatever becomes the priority that's first on your mind, don't skirt it away. Keep it there. And I want you simply to make a covenant. And here's the covenant I want you to make with God. God, I'm not making a choice between this and that. I'm making a choice for you. And in making the choice for you, I'm going to ask you to make the choice for this. Make, make that your prayer. If you have the courage to make that, make that your prayer. Everybody pray with me. God, I come in Jesus' name and I confess that I make the choice to believe that Jesus is Lord. Come into my life, save me, and I thank you that right now I accept the gift of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, put those hands together. My brother, my sister, if you're in physical space and you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to grab your belongings and meet me here at the front. I want to shake your hand. I want us to encourage you. And I want our officers to give you some information we'd like you to leave with. If you're in virtual space and you prayed that prayer for the first time, leave your contact information on the platform and our officers are going to get that and communicate with you very quickly. Let me see the hands of every person who is not a member of Mount Ararat. 
you're not a member of Mount Airy. Would you lift your hand real high, real high, real high, real high. God bless you. Those of you who have your hands raised, keep them up for just one moment because I want to ask you a question. And my question is this. If today were the last day you would have on this planet, would God be worth the decision for you to say yes and make your way to the front? If it was your last day, would God be worth the decision to say yes to him? And if the answer to that is yes, I, I would walk. If it were my last day, then because we don't know that tomorrow is promised, I want to encourage you to come now and then and at least settle this part of your life and your pilgrimage and your journey. Come on, make your way here to the front. We want to celebrate you. If you're online, bless your moving. If you're online, we encourage you to do the same. How? By leaving your information on the platform. And our officers are going to extract that. Yep, God bless you. That's what I'll be. And they'll communicate with you very, very quickly. Come on, who else? The door of the church is open in the balcony on this main floor. Everybody say, I will. I'll be what you call me to be. Come on, I can't hear you. I'll say yes. Lord, I agree. Come on, are we waiting on you? Yep, I thought so. Hallelujah. God be praised for you. Come on, who else? Who else? Who else? Everybody say, I, I will be. I'll say yes. Come on, who else? The door of the church is open for you. Today is God's yes to you. You make the choice to say yes to him. God bless you walking. Come on, who else? Who else? Who else? God bless you walking. God be praised for you. Yep, God be praised. God be praised. Yep, God bless you walking. I see you. What you? God bless you. Yep, God be praised for you. I'll say yes. Come on, who else? It's your day. It's your turn. It's your time. Come on, you got it in you. You take one step and God will take the rest. Yes, Lord. Yep, God bless you. I'll be praised for you. That's what I'll be. Come on, who else, who else, who else, who else? It's just a choice, it's a choice. It's a choice, I will be. God bless you. Yep, God bless you. I'll say yes. Bless you, my sister. Yep, I knew it, whole family comes. Lord, I, I'll save you and your whole household. Hallelujah. Passionately. Come on, who else, who else, who else, who else? That's what I'll be. I know choices are hard to make and sometimes they have to be delayed. So one more time, you make that choice today. Make that choice and just say yes. I'll say yes. Lord, I'll agree. My desire, Mount Aaron, help me. Praise God for these that come. It's to be. That's what I'll be.
May the Lord bless you. May God keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you. May God be gracious under you. May he lift up the light of his countenance round about you. And may he grant to you peace both now and forevermore. And all of God's children said together, amen. Mount Ararat, I love you. May the peace of God be yours.